we're going to kind of have an open and hopefully enjoyable chat today about a little problem. So, you know, I got hired by the U.S. government to run the National Cybersecurity Center. And that was to stitch together, help to link all the networks across military intelligence and the civilian government and to coordinate the defense of all those networks. And, and realized, you know, pretty quickly that there was some serious dinero being dropped down on this problem. I mean, like many, many billions of dollars. And having some background doing high-tech companies and, you know, software companies and Internet companies and also doing a lot of economic and finance work, I said, well, where's the risk management models? You know, don't we have a risk management model so we actually know what we're trying to get done in cybersecurity because we're going to spend, you know, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars over time, over, over decades. Shouldn't we really know? And the answer was no. There wasn't a model. And sometimes people would put up this little slide and say, you know, risk times threat times this or that. And that wasn't even a model. And I thought, well, you know, how can we go spend billions of dollars of taxpayers' money if we don't actually know what we're getting for it or think we're getting for it? So this work came out of that effort. So the initial, initial thing I was thinking about is how do you um, do risk management for cybersecurity? Okay. But then I thought about, well, you know, how are you going to figure out how to, how to protect a network and how much you should spend a network? I mean, how, how do you decide what the network is worth, right? I mean, because would you want to spend $100 billion protecting a network that's worth a billion dollars? That doesn't make much sense, right? So before you figure out how much you want to spend to protect something, you've got to figure out how much that thing is worth. And so that line of inquiry then led to looking at some things, namely looking at the traditional approaches to look at network valuation. So here's what we're going to do today is kind of look back to the history of how people have tried to approach this problem of saying what's a network worth, then talk about a new model that actually may work or actually does work to, to answer that question, and then we'll look at cybersecurity and kind of like different uh, ways to take the economic model and apply it. So now how many of you have, like, I mean, this is a, a DEF CON festival, so I imagine we're mostly techies here, but how many people have a background in engineering, math, science, or computers, network, administration? Okay. And is there anybody who's not comfortable with Greeks on the board? Good. Leave. If you're not comfortable with Greeks, leave. No, so we're going to we're throw some math up here today just to, because the, the, the stuff has some bones that's behind it. So anyway, and I'm Rod Beckstrom. Um, I've normally been a high-tech uh, entrepreneur, so I started my first software company when I was 24 that did uh, derivative trading systems. I was a quantitative trader at Morgan Stanley building my own derivative trading models um, in my early 20s, and then I left and started a company called Cat Software, and we got really lucky because we built these good analytical systems, and there really was a market. So second year in grad school, we sold about a million dollars of the software, and then we were able to actually build that up into a global company. So we had offices in New York, London, Tokyo, Sydney, Geneva, Hong Kong, kind of all over the place. And then we got really lucky because one of the professors I asked to help me start the company was a guy named Myron Scholes. Has anyone heard of Myron Scholes? Eh, the hand going up there. So what model did he invent? Exactly, Black Scholes. The Black Scholes, the fundamental options pricing theory. And what he did is he took the insights, he took the general diffusion equation out of thermodynamics and applied it to finance problems, and it worked. <laughs> so you know, he and, he and uh, Fisher Black took the diffusion model, applied it. That worked. So Myron was helping us, and then he was, just, he was just like a really smart professor at Stanford when we got to work with him. And it was really nice, though, because three years later, they gave him a Nobel Prize. So he helped us solve some of our modeling problems on looking at derivatives. And then we had another guy helping us out named Bill Sharp. Has anyone heard of Bill Sharp in finance or William F. Sharp, capital asset pricing model? Anyway... Bill did risk, risk return analysis and with two other guys helped develop the fundamental concepts of, of risk in finance and he too won the Nobel Prize. So we got to work with some really smart people and Bill actually helped us develop a model in economics for value at risk and encouraged me to write a book on that which was the first book that I wrote which almost no one knows of unless you're a finance weenie uh, and like risk management. But some of you may, may or may not have heard the book, a book I worked on called Starfish and Spider. Has anyone heard of the Starfish and Spider? All right. Um, so anyway, done, did some of that stuff, and then I got recruited by the government to help out in cybersecurity. And I thought, well, that'd be really interesting because I've done only private sector companies and nonprofit work for a long time. So let's go work for the government. 
So I did that, and that was fascinating. And that led to this work. So I was at DHS when we helped develop some of this stuff. And now I'm at ICANN. So it's my third, fourth week on the job at ICANN. So let's do a test. How many people have heard of ICANN? I know what ICANN does. All right. Um, so for those who don't, ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And what we do is we address the Internet. We're addressing the Internet. So when you go to a city, right, you open the phone book. I mean, is your phone, everyone's got a phone here. Is your phone number unique? I mean, if people call your phone number, do they get to you? Or do they get to, if they're calling from somewhere else in the world, do they get to somebody else? Your phone numbers are unique, right? Well, someone has to enforce that policy to make sure that every phone number on the planet Earth is unique. Um, someone has to do that on the Internet to make sure that every network address is unique and that those get handed out and allocated through the ISPs and all the different parties. Same thing with names. So when you go to your phone book, and who's got Smith as a last name here? Any Smiths? Bakers? No, no luck. Okay. Well, there's a lot of Smiths and Bakers in most cities. So in the, in the phone book, right, you got a lot of John Smiths. Well, on the Internet, do you have a lot of johnsmiths.com? No. You only get one, right? So there's naming integrity in the Internet to maintain global space, and there's addressing integrity. And ICANN is the group behind the curtains that runs that policy process and contracts with all the governments of the world and with the other parties and the registries to, hand, to, to allocate names and numbers. So anyway, that's what we do. There's about 200 million names in the world on the Internet that have been purchased, and there's about a billion numbers that have been allocated in IPv4, and then, of course, when we get to IPv6, it'll be trillions and trillions of numbers. So that's what ICANN does. It's a nonprofit, and it doesn't work alone. It's part of an ecosystem. The kind of the amazing thing about the Internet is, and some of you actually are probably work with one of these groups. So ICANN, IETF, and Internet Society are three of the key players in the ecosystem. How many of you have heard of IETF or been, or been a member? Thank you. If you're a member and you're a contributor, and I have my advertisement for ITF on here because I just got back from Stockholm, and Vint Cerf was introducing me to all the, you know, the gods of the Internet. But IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, and these brains here develop all of the protocols for the Internet, whether it's IPv4, IPv6, HTML5, um, wireless standards, all kind. like we were talking about IPv6 and the Internet of Things there and how to do low-power devices and get them on the Internet. And I don't mean to geek out and all that, but anyway, the Internet ecosystem is amazing because it's run by these nonprofits. In total, those three groups, they have thousands and thousands of volunteers, like many of you in the room, and only 200 employees. So there's only 200 employees in the world that are basically coordinating these basic functions of the Internet that are used by 1.5 billion people. So that's one person per 7.5 million users. Anyway, and I'm the lucky guy. I got hired to be CEO and president of ICANN, so I'm totally thrilled about it. So that's that background. So why do, why do the economics matter? You know, does it matter? Well, I think if a government's dropping tens of billions of dollars right into a problem i think it matters and if our companies you know your companies are putting tens or hundreds of millions of dollars into it we've got to really ask some hard questions about where's the payoff and what we need is kind of a framework to to hang it off of and let's look at some of the questions that we might want to look at you know just to make it really granular and personal you know what is the internet worth to you personally what's it worth to you that's an economic question that we need to have a framework for answering. What's the total value of a network? Maybe your social network with 50 friends in it on Facebook. Or it may be a business network with 2,000 companies. Or it may be the internet with 1.5 billion people. What is that whole network worth? How are we going to approach that? What are the economics of security? What about security risk management? So how are we going to do risk management and make decisions? What are hacker economics? How many of you are hackers? How many hackers we got in the room? All right, we've got some hackers. So we've got to look at your economic model. You know, how do you make money? Because we have to understand that if we wanted to defer, deter your activity, make it harder, okay? Um, and maybe you're a red teamer, you know, uh, on, on the light side. But otherwise, you're on the other side. But we need to understand the economics of deterrence. We can look at other problems that we're about to spend billions of dollars on or throw policy solutions at that won't work. Um, or we can use economic models to figure out how to incentivize the right behavior. So supply chain, how are we going to get it cleaned up, get, the, get the, the, the malicious code out of the supply chain? And then we want to look at things like the protocols themselves. 
the internet, the, that are holding the internet together, and what are the economics of them? What are the economics of outages? What's the economics of resilience? So these are all really important problems, and here's the good news. We can actually answer them, okay? It's actually pretty easy, pretty easy from a conceptual standpoint, uh, and then there's some work into getting it done. But before we, you know, jump forward, you know, let's go back. So what is the law that most people refer to if they talk about what's the value of a network? What's, it was, if, who was at Bob Lentz's presentation yesterday morning? He mentioned it. It's a guy who worked on Ethernet. Giving you a hint. Metcalf. So people usually talk about Metcalf's law, right? And what does Metcalf's law say? Anyone remember what Metcalf's law says? Okay. What, but what it says, that's right, is that the value of a network, let's say network J, the value of network J is equal to the square of the number of nodes on that network or endpoints times P, which is some constant. So basically, the value of every network in the world is portrayed by a picture that goes zoop, and it goes screaming upwards, right? Does anyone want to buy stock based on that? You want to value a network based on that? Has this ever been done? It was in the late 90s, okay? Metcalf's law was just used to justify, you know, 10, 30, 50, 100 billion dollar valuations of these networking companies that were grabbing a piece of the network, you know, like pets.com. Um, so, and, the, and, the, and what was the story? People remember the network that, was, that Metcalf used to justify um, why this model worked or should work? Fax network, sound familiar? Right? So what Metcalf said was, well, look, obviously, you know, th this is proven because the more people get faxes and the more people can communicate and the value just keeps going up. Now, is that really true? I mean, is it really valuable to you that another 10 million people in Africa just added fax machines in the last year? How many of you care about the, new, the 10 million machines in Africa? Okay. Well, if you don't care about those 10 million fax machines in Africa or a lot of other countries, then why would there be this geometric progression? So this was what Metcalf's law said. What it really relates to is the number of possible connections in a network is equal to mathematically n times in parentheses n minus 1 all divided by 2, which is a geometric progression that goes at half this rate, basically. And it doesn't work, okay? The problem with Metcalf's law is it doesn't work. It doesn't tell you anything except the potential number of nodes in a network. So no one's used it for real valuation. So you can't use it to determine how much to invest in cybersecurity or national policy or any other issue, uh, your own uh, corporate investment. So then other people came along and said, well, you know, the problem with Metcalf's law is it goes forever, right? It just goes zoop, goes zooming up. So ZIPF came along, Z-I-P-F, and ZIPF said, I've got a law, and I'm going to have it taper out. I'm going to have it go up, and then I'm going to have it hit a peak, and then I'm going to have it curve down. Okay, so I'll add another little, you know, factor in the equation. Well, that's kind of good, but how are you supposed to get that other number, and what does it really mean? And then Reed came along at Harvard, and Reed said, well, I'm going to do Reed's law, and Reed's law is going to say, what's the number of sets of people, of groups you can organize in a network? So the two of us could form a group, just the two of us, and then you and, and him, and then you and three other people, five. So think of all the different sets in this room. Okay, I don't know how many people we have in the room, someone smarter than me, but you know, it's probably like 10,000 sets or something we could have. Who cares? Who cares? Okay, it's irrelevant. It's just a theoretical, like, so Reed's Law was interesting about what's the total number of, of sets you could have. It doesn't really have any practical application. Well, there's one thing that all those models had in common. And by the way, and I spent years trying to fix Metcalf's Law. Okay, I took Metcalf's Law right here, and I tried to add in substitutes. Because I looked at the email, no uh, I mean, faxes, and I said, well, emails are a substitute, so they're making the fax network less valuable. So let's add substitutes to the equation. Let's add latency to the equation. Let's add peer cohesion of the participant. I started adding all these things to the equation, and some people thought, well, maybe that's really interesting, what Beckstrom's working on. And then I realized one day, when I was confronted with this problem on cybersecurity, I said, it's, it's a total joke. I'm just on the, the wrong track. I'm not going to get there. And so what I finally realized, and this was the realization that came last June, I was working on the problem on the whiteboard, which is it's not about N. It's about T. What is N? N is the number of nodes in a network. So think about the Internet of Things. We're going from de you know, devices and computers to sensors and light bulbs and toasters and refrigerators. So you assume this you know, huge network of a trillion things. Well, the value of the, the network's not about how many endpoints or nodes you've got at all. 
That is not what's relevant. Because you might have a PC in your house that, that three people use. Or you may have eight machines that three people use. Kind of like we have at our house, four people use. So what's T? So what's the T that matters in the economics? And that's transactions. What really matters in network economics and even cybersecurity is it's all about the transactions that we either want to have happen or don't want to have happen. That's the, and, and once I got that insight, then the question was, okay, how do you build an economic model around transactions that actually makes sense so that you can value a network? So another way to, to express this, I want to talk about a little bit, since some of you have heard of the starfish and spider. So the problem with the end view, looking at the size of a network and trying to say, you know, what's it worth, is that the end view is a centralized spider-like perspective. Because you're looking at the network as a whole and you're saying, all I have to know is how many endpoints there are, okay? Well, that's a spider-like approach, totally centralized. The transaction approach is completely the opposite. It's very starfish-like or decentralized. And we, we use the starfish as a metaphor for decentralization because you can cut off an arm and it regenerates because it's pretty decentralized. Or if you cut off all five arms in this species here, you get five new starfish. Each arm can regenerate an entire new living starfish. Why? Because it's completely decentralized. It doesn't have a centralized brain or a centralized uh, nervous system or other central organs. It's got a nerve ring that's centralized to, to, to send messages, and it can regenerate that nerve ring. So when we look at transaction, we're decentralizing the problem, and we're going to look at the network not from the middle but from the edge, from each one of you, from every one of you. We're going to look at the economics of the network to you and the perspective. And if we can figure out what the network's worth to you, and then just another billion and a half people on the earth, we can solve the problem. So here's, the, here's Beckstrom's law, and that is... The value of a network equals the net value added to each user's transactions from their standpoint, by the way, summed for all users. Okay? That's the English. It's pretty simple. Or mathematically, we're going to look at the value to you. So you are VI. You are V of, what's your name, sir, in the orange shirt here? Corey. So Corey in the orange shirt up here, thanks for volunteering. Raise your hand, Corey. All right. Corey, we're going to look at the value of the network to Corey as an example. And he's, uh, he's, he's the first instance of I, and then J is the network. So, like, we'll say the value of the network for Corey is what we're going to look at. And what the value of the network is to Corey is the sigma, the summation function of the benefit of all transaction Corey's going to do on the Internet for, say, one year minus the cost of all transactions. So, very simple framework, and we're going to get into making it a little more explicit in a second. But let's just do a simple example. I mean, Corey, do you ever buy books on, online? Okay, you buy books online. Like, how many do you buy a year? About 20 books a year. And what do you think, what's the average price on those books, would you say? About 30 bucks. So, you're buying some science books, security books, hardbacks. So, 30 bucks a year is what you pay online. What do you think you'd pay on average for those books if you went to a bookstore? About the same. And how much, and, and, and if you went to a bookstore, presumably you'd spend some time, right? Take more of your time to drive, spend some gas. Can we say that your time to go buy a book is probably worth at least 10 bucks? Okay. So if Corey can buy a same $30 book online that he'd have to go to the, the store and spend $10 of his time, on average, the network is adding $10 to his transaction. And if he buys 20 bucks a year, then he's 20 bucks, he's saving $200 a year just in book transactions. Do you buy many, do you, your books represent like how much of your purchases online as a percentage, like a third, a half, 10%? Maybe a fifth. So let's just say for, for a second, there's 200 bucks there, and you do a lot more transactions, five times that many. And uh, are they probably average about the same size, or some of them bigger and some of them smaller? About the same. So if it's about the same, so for Corey, he's saving about a thousand bucks a year. Then five times two hundred bucks on those transactions. Now you probably do emails too, right? Okay, and you probably uh, you know are sending a lot of documents around. You do web research or use you know search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo. Okay. We're going to take, if we take Corey and we look at every transaction he does in a year, and by the way, this is easy on computers, right? All we got to do is key log it. I mean, this is an economist's dream. 
The network is the most measurable thing on the planet Earth, these transactions. We can get everything. It's a little harder to go figure out what it costs him to go to the store in terms of time. Then we have to ask him, you know, how much is your time worth? You know, you probably value your time at 100 bucks, 200 bucks an hour, right? So it probably takes a half hour to get to the store and back, maybe 40 minutes. Say half hour, say your time's worth 200 bucks. So it's actually cost you 100 bucks to go get at the store. So... What we're doing is illustrating, if, let's say Corey's transaction, he's saving 1000 bucks on products, plus you're doing research and emails. Now, another way we can figure out what the network's worth to him is what do we do? We tell him, Corey, now we go to his computer, right? And we take a hammer, we break the wireless card, and we unplug the back of it and say, you're disconnected. You can't go online for a month. What's it worth to you? What do you think you'd pay to go online if you couldn't go online at home? At least a grand, a month or a year? <laughs> and you're not sure. Well, you'll, you'll figure it out. You'd probably pay quite a bit. That's another way to look at the value. But So once we know, let's say the, the network value to Corey is 3000 bucks a year okay, at home. Now, that's not his job. It's also got value to him and his job. But that's just to Corey as an individual. Well, we're now answering this question then because we've got sigma benefit for Corey is about net benefit, we're saying is 3000 So actually, he's saving money on transactions, but you're paying, how much you pay for connectivity every month, Corey? 40 bucks a month. So $480 a month, plus you use a little tiny bit of electricity, plus you wear it on your computer a little bit, but you probably have it anyway. So if you look at all the, the benefits and the costs, then you're going to figure out what the net value is to Corey. Okay, so now we've got our building block. So if we're going to take it in the real math, or just make it more explicit, we're going to get more formalized. And I'm going to go, we're going to scale now from Corey, one user, to the whole room and all the internet. So what we're going to say is just sigma for all users i on this network, which is the internet. So sigma i equals 1 to n, all users of the network, v of i sub j is equal to the summation of the benefits for every single user, okay, the benefit transactions minus the cost transactions. And then a little, little function on the bottom, 1 plus e raised to the power of t, is, is just dis, we call discounted cash flow analysis. So in other words, if, if he saves $1,000 this month, uh, it's worth more than saving it $1,000 a year from now or five years from now. But this is the explicit formula. And this is the, from this model, you can value any network in the world. Now, the challenge is you've got to go figure out what your transactions are. Right? You gotta, but as I said, it's pretty easy to figure out what we're doing online because we can keystroke log it. Okay? Um, and then some of that finance we can measure. Our costs are pretty easy to measure. The benefits are a lot harder because then we've got to go find out what it would cost to go replace that product or service elsewhere. Okay? Um, but this, so the, the fundamental notion of the law is it's entirely transaction-based. And you have benefit transaction and cost transactions. And, and the, now, why would they not line up the same? As you notice, there's different counters here. There's K equals 1 to M on the benefits, and there's L equals 1 to P on the costs. Why would we use a different counter? And by the way, someone in Slashdot corrected my notation on this. I was using, I was using N equals uh, uh, 1 to N. I mean, uh, I equals 1 to N on everything, and someone in Slashdot slashed me up. It's like, what are you doing? That's sloppy. You know, you need different counters. And it's like, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for the catch. <laughs> but why would there be different counters on um, uh, the benefits versus, versus the costs? Okay, so we do the book example. He's going to pay 30 bucks, and he gets a book that has some value. So that's kind of paired, right? But what about his Internet service, right? Do you, you probably pay monthly, right? But you use the Internet how often? Every day or every minute or every second or every hour, depending upon how big an addict you are, Corey. Okay, right? So, they're, they're, so the transactions are not matched. So your cost transactions are not identical to your benefit transactions. Sometimes they'll pair up. But so there's separate counters on here. So this is the foundation, and then we should roll forward. What then is the network effect, right? We've, we've all heard about the network effect, right? The incredible network effect. What is the network effect? What is it mathematically? Can we even define it mathematically? Well, it ends up we can. We're now just going to leverage the model we just developed, this transaction-based model, and explicitly define the condition where the network effect is present. So this is not the driver of the network effect, but this is a test to determine whether the network effect is present or not. And that's simply we're going to use the summation function. The only thing difference between the two sides of this equation is n plus 1 on the top versus n. 
So we're going to take a network, we're going to say it's like this room and we're all in a club together, okay? We're going to let one more member in the door, okay? That person comes in, what happens to the value of the network? If the value of the network increases because that person came in and they're adding value, so they're not jumping up and down and screaming and interrupting us and, you know, being annoying or whatever, if they're a positive contributor and the value of the network increased, then we get a greater than sign, okay? So the network is now more valuable. But that's the perspective of the entire network, including that person. But what we're sitting in the room, right? And if, if we're sitting here, do, what do, you, do you really care about the value of the overall network? Well, maybe, if you're really magnanimous. But if you're just looking at your own position, you care about the value to you. So let's tweak the model and look at it from your standpoint, or the standpoint of the existing members of a network. The value then becomes the value of the N plus 1 network minus the value of that N plus 1 individual. Let's take their value out. And then look at, did the value of, of our network increase? And this is the one that MySpace may have missed, right? Because how do we know in part that these rules are, are valid? Let's look at the news this week. Did, what, did, what did Bill Gates, did Bill Gates say something about Facebook? What did Bill Gates say about Facebook? Too many friends. So what did he do? He quit and left. Why? Not useful. He's wasting his time. So, look, if Metcalf's law was true, then Bill Gates would say, well, the more friends, the better. But that's not true because he got the transactions he didn't want to have, which is all those updates and notices and all those things that pester us, right? I mean, I actually thought, well, geez, you know, should I think about the same thing? I'm getting pretty tired of Facebook messages at this point. You know, my network's over 1,000, I think, of friends, and it just keeps growing. So... Here we come back. So here's the acid test, and here's where MySpace is on a declining slope, I'd argue, and Facebook, I don't know where they are. But you got new users coming onto MySpace, and they think it's good for them, but they're overloading other people, so the value to other users is going down. So if you get past the tipping point, there's a positive network effect, then there's a negative network effect. Here we're on the positive. So we're saying, you know, it's just like the early days in Facebook, and we're so excited to connect to those colleagues we worked with five years ago or people we went to high school with or from our hometown. It's, like, so cool, and how oh, we can connect to all these people. Isn't it amazing? And, yeah, that great feeling until you keep getting more and more and more and more and more and more. And then you get the inverse network effect. So here's the inverse network effect. We can use the same math. It's just a lesser than symbol. We've now gotten to a point where the larger network, N plus 1, is worth less than the network was worth before. And to make it more explicit, we're now going to look at the previous members and take out one member. So we're going to take out the latest person that just joined, you know, the Facebook community and say, you know what, this guy has come in or this gal's come in and now my network's worth less. Why? Because I'm past the growth point. And we're going to come on to security in a second. But the, the beauty is, once we have this really ridiculously simple model, because the model is ridiculously simple. It's just tally your transactions and measure them. Once we have that, we're able to start doing a lot of different quantitative measures to figure out where we are in a system. And we can start developing the conceptual models as well. Because the underlying ideas are really simple, right? I mean, I don't think it would be much simpler. So let's look at some examples. So who here plays golf? Who plays golf? Okay. Who here is in a private golf club? Okay, sir. Um, what's the name of your golf club? Grand Oak. Grand Oak. Do you mind coming up the microphone, by the way, if I could ask you, please? So you're in Grand Oak Golf Club. And what's your name, sir? Chris. Chris. And how many members do you have? Too many. Too many? Uh, I don't know how many, but... Okay, like maybe 400 or 500? Pro yeah. Okay. Now, why do you say there's too many? It's uh, become increasingly difficult to get a tee time. Thank you very much. So would you say that the next member is, is adding a, in a, you're in the positive network effect zone or the that, inverse? Inverse, definitely. So you're in the inverse network effect zone. Yep. Okay. Now, did you, and as a private club, you had to buy in to buy your piece, right? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it's cheaper now, right, because you're spreading your costs over more people, but you're not getting the transaction you want, are you? Right, less enjoyable. Less enjoyable because you're not getting your tea time, and that's the transaction you value. So we go back to Beckstrom's law, your B is lower. Your benefit's lower because you're not getting the time slot you want. Does anyone know what the average size of these private golf clubs is around the world? It's about four to 500 people. You know why? Because we'll look at how often you go play. How often do you play golf? Uh, twice a month now. Right? 
that's pretty average for a lot of lot of clubs. Lot, a lot of clubs. So the tee times are staggered. You know, every 12 minutes, right, or every 15. You know, and so only so much can get in. So golf clubs are a great example because you know if it only had 200 members, it might be a little expensive, right? So you're probably okay up to some zone, and then somebody took it too far. So that's so. Thank you, thank you very much. That's a great example. So golf clubs show us these principles at work, and think about your online networks. Okay, it's the same thing. You don't want them too big, but support groups. So has anyone been in like a cancer support group or any kind of support group? You know, no one wants to talk about it. Okay, don't raise your hands. Support groups tend to be best when they're around ten people. Why? And this is a social network. Why would support groups be best with 10 people? I mean, wouldn't you think the more people supporting you, the better? Right? I mean, I get 10 people support me. Wouldn't it be better if 50 people supported me? What are the transactions, though, that you do in a support group? What are the transactions? You support each other. Well, you listen, right? You have a listening transaction. So I'm in listening mode, right? And you have a talking mode. Now, let's talk about talking mode. If you've got 10 people... What percent of the time are you talking? 10% on average. You got 50 people, what percent of the time are you talking? 2%. People want to be heard. So we, we're happy to support each other, but we want to share as well as, as, as listening. So support groups tend to be best around 10 people. So it's another example where the transaction set and the trust level is defining the right size. Facebook, we just talked about Facebook. YPO, I'm a member of Young President's Organization. It's a global network of CEOs. It's hard to get into. You have to meet a certain you know, level of revenues and employees and this and that. And so it's like this club, these people love each other all over the world because they have a lot of things in common and age. They've got to be young and they've got to be a certain size company and they face the same challenges and stresses. Well, of course, people always come on and say, well, let's just open up the membership definition. Let's just make it easier to get in. Well, is that going to make the, valuable, the network more valuable or less valuable? Make it less valuable for the people that are in it if they've really got cohesion in what they're doing. So uh, Twitter, you know, I saw, I mean, how many people have Twitter accounts here? Okay, how many people are on Twitter every day? All right, as a subset of us, okay. There's an issue, question in Twitter is what, what are those followerships worth, right? I mean, because you can build huge networks and followerships. I got 5,000 people following me on Twitter. You know, what does it mean? You know, I guess it's good because some people want to hear the ideas and some people, you know, want to share. Some people could care less. They just want me to follow them, and I've got auto follow turned on, right? So people are scaling up and, and building their followerships. So AARP, how many people are members of AARP? Okay. So is AARP worth more with more members, or does it get too big at any point and become less valuable with members? What do you think? That's right. It's more valuable. And why? It's all about the transactions. It's a purchasing block. It's a lobbying block, you know, and, and every member that comes in is putting more money in. They deliver more services that get spread out across everybody. So AARP has a business model where it stays perpetually in the network effect. doesn't have the same dynamics of a Facebook or, or, or a MySpace, right? It's a different kind of network. So we're talking about this stuff so we can start thinking how the economic model applies what's right. But I know we want to get to security, so I get it moving on. But we can do this with almost any organization you're in. You can do it with every network in your life. Every network you're involved in, in fact, implicitly, you do that analysis at some level, right? Do I stay in that church or do I move to another or this synagogue or, you know, temple, whatever? I'm, or, you know, do I stay here? Do I go there? These are, these are relationships and transactions that you're going through. You can look at it through the economic lens. Now let's go to security. All right, so the basic model, if we simplify it, is the value is equal to benefits minus cost of all the transactions. Now let's go to security. We're going to take our cost transactions and we're going to break out our security investments. So SI is security investments. And we're going to take our losses because the hackers get in every now and then and they're successful. When they're not on the golf course, they're, they're out there doing their job and they're getting into our systems. All right. So we're going to, now it's benefit minus costs except security and investment losses, which are going to separate separately. Now, this is a very subtle move, but it blew me away when something really simple happened next. And here's what happened. We now got our risk management function for cybersecurity. Whew. The thing we started to, started to try on the very beginning, the very simple function. We're trying to minimize our security costs. Security investments plus losses. 
Now, I was working at Homeland Security with a lot of people that dedicated their lives to protecting this country, risking their lives. And when I put this formula up, you know what a lot of them said? You know, you're a heretic. Security's not an, a cost. Security's an asset. Security is an asset. I said, no, it's, it's only an asset if a dollar in security is producing more than a dollar reduction in losses. And otherwise, it's a waste of money, okay? Because what you're trying to do is preserve overall health and wealth for society. Um, and, and that wasn't a diss. Actually, a lot of people in Homeland Security really like this. They're like, that's really good. That's really clear. So we have a function. Now let's start looking at, at some other economic tricks and tools that we can take. So now let's just map. So we'll take a you know, vertical element, and we'll look at our losses and map those versus our security investment. So if we invest zero in security, we have no firewalls, nothing. Everything's wide open. How much are our losses going to be? It's going to be a lot, right? We're going to get rated of everything all the time. Now, if we just do the basics, right, like what are the two or three basics that we should do in security? Firewalls, IDS, patches, you know, antivirus. You do the basics, you get a huge payoff. So we had this curve dropping way down. Okay, and this is a hypothetical curve, but it kind of, I'm taking us through the reasoning. Okay? Um, but then, and then if we start tightening up our security, I mean, can we ever get perfect security? You know, Right, we never get perfect security. So it becomes asymptotic at the bottom. I mean, you could spend an infinite amount. You could spend billions of dollars in security investments to protect a million-dollar company, and you still wouldn't be secure if you're using electronics. Okay? So the reality is, we got to figure out where we want to be, and we got to figure out how our projects stack up. So, in the federal context, for exemplary, you know, as an example, I looked at the, the issue and I said, the biggest payoff. If I talk to the smart en engineers at IETF or at DHNS, Homeland Security Science and Technology, other places, they'd say, look, you got to you got to improve internet protocols. Because if you don't tighten up DNS, and DNS is getting attacked, and by the way, and that's a cybersecurity piece that ICANN is involved in. We, our role is to help protect the domain name system. Um, it's in our charter. But if you improve the protocols of the network itself, then you can uh, increase things. Because I tell people, okay, I tell people, I'd say, look, we could go spend a trillion dollars on cybersecurity, but if we don't implement DNSSEC, and if we don't develop BGPSEC or Border Gateway Protocol Secure and get it rolled out and tighten up SMTP and other protocols, then it's just it's leaky like a sieve. I mean, it's like instead of putting our fingers in a dike, we're putting our fingers in a fishnet. Now, how much water do you stop by putting your fingers into a huge fishnet? You, don't, you only slow down a little water around your hands. You don't really stop the problem. The system's wide open. Okay? So anyway, IP, I, I, I'd argue from a federal standpoint uh, for U.S. government and other governments around the world, same problem. Focusing on the protocols is the best single investment we can do in rolling out DNS, BGP, et cetera, according to the experts. Patches, we talk about the patches, the values of that, IDS, data loss protection. So what we're trying to do here is get people, to, for us to start thinking, what is the payoff? What's the money we're going to put in, and what's the payoff we're going to get? Um, so if, let's look at the chart again. So that was a, it's called a Pareto curve in economics. It's like the most optimal set of investments that you could make. And the curve function moves down when we, when we improve the protocols, okay? Because the security across everything gets a little bit tighter. It's an incredible bang for the buck because that curve drops not just for your company, you know, or my company or my home or your employer or, or this country or that. It's for everyone in the world, everyone on the Internet. Huge payoff. Economics of deterrence, so we've got to deter the hackers. So what we've got to do is drop the benefit function to the extent we can. All right, make it harder to use those credit cards, um, and increase the cost. Increase the cost of buying hacks and, and, and techniques. And the FBI had a good presentation on that at, at uh, uh, Black Hat. Make it make it more expensive. The security investment of the hacker is obfuscation and anonymity. They're they're trying to stay secure by you not finding them. Okay, and they they have to spend a lot of money and a lot of energy and effort on that. And then what's their loss? The loss is going to jail, or losing your money or getting sued and tied up in courts. So this is the economics of deterrence. And then from a law enforcement standpoint and a corporate standpoint, we've got to figure out how do we change these dynamics? How do we raise the bar? Anyway, we went over the points since, so we kind of reviewed it. The model can be used to calculate the value of a network. You just got to go get all that transaction data. You can optimize your investments once you figure out and analyze and get that data. You can also use it to set up policies for supply chain and other problems. Here's some of the, there, there's a big drawback on the model we're going to get to in a second, but there's a lot of benefits. 
Some of the benefits are it's granular, right? It's down to every single keystroke that you use in transactions. It's scalable. So you can scale it to internet or any huge network. It's subsetable. Because we use, we did a trick here, we're using net economic value, we're able to sum up all of our stuff and have no double counting. And by the way, us is not just individuals. It's corporations, governments, anybody. It's anyone that transacts on the net is a user by the definition of this model. It doesn't have to be Corey, you know, or Sally, or Sam. It's, it's any entity that contracts. So it's subsettable. We can use set theory. It's accurate. It's very similar to P&L concepts, so you can get financial people to understand it when you go to your CFO and others. It leverages traditional cost accounting techniques, so we can amortize. If you paid your virus checker annually, for example, we can amortize that monthly. We can use all those traditional cost accounting techniques. It's testable, and it's as simple as it can be, but no simpler. Uh, and it's a foundation for derivative models. We took the model. We applied it to um, deterrence. We applied it to security. You can apply it to a whole range of different issues. There's only one problem. There's a really big problem. And then the model is only as good as the data as you put into it, right? So you've got to get the data or estimate the data. And we did that for Corey with his book purchases and other online transaction purchases. Think about your companies. Think about your organizations. Um, so and the net message that wraps it all together is very simply it's all about T. It's all about the transactions to do e uh, network economics and looking at security and is it including the transactions you want to avoid. The hacker's doing a transaction you want to avoid, stealing your money or your IP assets. It's not about in. It's not about the numbers. Um, so that's the model overall. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes, please. And there's a mic up here if you want to come up to the mic or if you just want to raise your hand. And for, for the Twitter example, I yeah. had a question. And I agree having more people is, is clutter on Facebook and Twitter. But the one thing that I found with either of those, the more people in my network, um, the higher, w when I have a question, the higher the probability that I'll get a good answer. Um, so is there a way to balance or factor into the equation um, value of the, the particular type of transaction? Because to me, the, the tire that blew off my lawnmower, somebody said, ah, oh, spray starter fluid in it, hit it with a lighter, and it'll blow it back on the rim and thank god it worked uh so to me there was good value in having you know that extra person who gave me that insightful information but i would agree the inverse you know all the updates you know i'm eating toast sure uh, stuff like that so let's decompose this so what i'm hearing you say is that so you pose a question out there and the more followers you have or people are connected to you the higher the quality of the answer comes if you pose a question so let's decompose that in terms of the model What's, what, what's the cost transaction and what's the benefit transaction? The benefit is, the, is, the, is a better answer coming back, right? right? So that's valuable to you. You got to you know, blow the, 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 the whatever was that out of the spray can and the carburetor yeah. and get it going. So you got a better benefit because you had a bigger end, bigger number of users in your network, which might take you a little more time in general. But, so what you're saying is, is I can handle some of that noise traffic, you know, or maybe I'll ignore a lot of noise traffic, and I'm just going to go drop out what I want and look for an answer, so I want a bigger pot and pool. And actually, I, I concur, I, it's a great observation, and I think it shows how the model can help us step through it. And for me, it's true, like Twitter, I, I, I'm happy to have a ton of followers on Twitter, because Twitter, I don't respond to every single direct message. Right, you okay? filter. But I do, when I send stuff out, I get good feedback, you know, or I have a good, good pointers and articles. Um, so, I, I thought... Does someone else have a question about the security model? Okay. Well, great. Well, that's it. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, there's my contact coordinates. The slides will be on slideshare.net. They're not on your DVD because these just slides just got tweaked before I did the presentation this morning. But they're on slideshare.net under Beckstrom's Law DEF CON. And thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards in the room. Hey, folks, before you get too far, please go this way. Now clap. Thank you. Thank you very much.